Good morning. Oh, wow. I'm on. Woo. Woo. Saturday. <laughs> uh, I guess it's time. I'm, I'm 10 seconds early according to this clock, but let's do this anyway. I have a lot of slides. 251 according to Keynote. Uh, <laughs> So this is the interactive portion of my presentation. Um, everyone, like, I, unlock your phones, take out your phones, take a look. I'm just gonna get this out of the way real quick here. Okay, just two, two minutes of your time. All right, everyone. I'm sorry, okay, okay. Uh, let's move on with our presentation. <laughs> sorry, this is for me, this isn't for you, this is for me. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you for coming to my presentation about selfie sticks. Uh, <laughs> there are two purposes to selfie sticks. The first uh, important purpose is to help you identify people who do not, who like fun stuff and like to have a good time and a fun time. The other purpose of a selfie stick is to let you know who doesn't like to have fun or fun things. So I recommend that you all get a selfie stick. Uh, by the way, have any of you, have any of you seen this photo around? <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> I've been, I've been sending airdrops to everybody here, and unfortunately, some people decline me. It makes me sad. <laughs> I was a, I like to do this wherever I go. I was actually, I was at an airport once, and there was a group of um, older people traveling together, and they, they, were, they were coming home from vacation, and they were like, oh, let's, let's share all of our photos, and, and they are like, how are we gonna do it? And I hear one guy say, oh, let's just airdrop them to each other, and you know, take out your phones, and we'll send them, and I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I send them, I send them like photos of my cat, and one, one guy's like, what is this cat photo? <laughs> <laughs> now, if you're, if you're gonna do this, though, you need to make sure, like, so make sure to name your phone something nondescript, like mine, my phone is named iPhone, <laughs> so. <laughs> ah, refreshing coffee. Uh, <laughs> let me show you, I just wanna show you a few of the photos that I have received. This is, that is, that is cute. Uh, we got another one here, and then I got this. <laughs> this is a good one. I got this one. Uh, <laughs> And then, <laughs> and I love it, I love it when I, when I hear about people saying, like, who is, who is doing all of this? Like, I saw this. <laughs> I'm like, yes, success. I, I have done it. <laughs> all right. So today we're going to talk about methods of memory management and MRI, or mmm, Ruby. <laughs> So we're at a, this is actually an MRuby talk, but many, many M's. Uh, my, name, my name is Aaron Patterson, or uh, Tenderlove. That is my nerd code at the bottom there, so if you want to send encrypted things to me, you can. Uh, I noticed that we are having a cheerleading competition here, which I think is really amazing. Uh, but I, I like to think that it's actually probably a mockumentary filming, and I really want to go see. Uh, if you, th this is what I look like on the internet. Uh, I look different in person, so if that you might recognize that icon more than me in person. Uh, I'm from Seattle, uh, which is not Ohio, so. I, but I wanted to share with you, like, my, my wife is from Japan, and we like, we like to uh, practice Ohio culture, which is essentially every morning we say Ohio to each other. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry, I only have 30 minutes for this talk, don't I? We're so screwed, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I work for a company called uh, GitHub. It is a small startup out of California, uh, but I don't live in California, as I said, I live in Seattle. Uh, this, this company is the first legit company I've ever worked for. Um, 
I love, like, I love using Git, but I'm not going to force push it on all of you, so. <laughs> Room is slowly, <laughs> slowly turning against me. Uh, <laughs> So I'm a, Git, I'm a GitHub certified engineer, which means I really enjoy bare metal. Um, my name on there is Tenderlove, uh, and it was weird starting at GitHub because everybody refers to everybody else by their nicks. So when I showed up at the when I showed up at the office, and just to give you a little background, I've been working remotely for about the past six years, so I don't really interact with many coworkers. IRL. Uh, so I go, I go into the office and everybody is calling me tender love and I'm like, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> please, you can call, you can please call me Aaron. <laughs> but tender, tender love is fine too, you can call me that. Uh, actually, you know what, I'm gonna tell a story, I don't care. We're gonna have to move very quickly but I will tell the story. Uh, my, my parents are both engineers. Uh, so it's not weird to them that I sit at a computer and do my job all day. I tell them everything I do, everything about myself, except for this one little thing, this name. They do not know this name. Uh, they didn't know this name. Uh, I was invited to speak at a conference in Salt Lake City, which is where I was, where I was born. My parents still live there. Uh, and I said, okay, I'll speak at this conference, but only if you give me two free tickets for my parents. And of course, the organizer's like, absolutely, we would love to do that. So I show up at the conference with my parents. We meet the conference organizer. Uh, the organizer said, I'm like, hey, you know, here's my parents. The organizer says, okay, great, you're up, you know, you're gonna be up real soon, uh, but we've reserved three seats for you down at the front. Of, down at the front. So he takes us down to the front, and there's three seats, three seats at the front, and there's three signs, and the first sign says tender love, the next sign says tender mom, the next sign says tender dad, <laughs> and, and I'm just like, no. <laughs> not now, not now. <laughs> So I had to tell them. I had to tell them, like, look, this is just a name. People know me by. Be cool. Don't worry about it. They're gonna ask you. They're gonna ask you about it. Just don't worry. You don't need to know. And we've never talked about it since. So it's fine. <laughs> anyway, I, I love cats. Cats are the best. This is one of my cats. This is Choo Choo. Uh, she isn't as famous as Gorby. This is Gorby. Gorb Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunderhorse. He is hiding here. He thinks he's hiding, which I think is adorable. Uh, Choo Choo likes to sit on my sit on my desk. She's sitting on my desk, and she makes this face that I really love. This is the face. It's the same face I make when I'm programming. It's just like, <laughs> just nothing. Staring at a screen, just bleh. So I have, I have stickers of my cat, so if you'd like a sticker of my cat, come say hello to me. Uh, I also have GitHub stickers, I think. Um, I ordered some from our online store, and it said like, "Oh, you, you know, order some sticker packs. Order as many as you, you know, as many as you want." And I see there's a drop down, which was kind of funny because the drop down was the numbers one through two hundred, like each one. <laughs> like, okay, well, and they're assorted stickers, so I assume that if I ordered one, that would be like one pack of assorted stickers, right? Because like, why would you order one if it's a random sticker? Why would you order one? <laughs> and they would mail you one, it doesn't make sense. So I'm like, well, you know, Rubikoff, I'll just order like, I'm not sure how many are in the pack, I'll order five, that seems fine. So I order five, and then five stickers show up. <laughs> and unfortunately, I forgot the, to bring those five stickers. <laughs> but I have some co one of my coworkers who is actually speaking right now as well, uh, she brought some stickers and was nice enough to give me some. So I have some of those. Um, I was recently in the news, uh, I approved a pull request. Um, <laughs> I'm also very much into keyboards. This is, one of my, this is one of my keyboards. I love mechanical keyboards, so if you want to talk about that, come, come talk to me. Uh, the, the interesting thing about this keyboard is that it's backlit, but it's backlit with ultraviolet LEDs so that I can get tan hands. Well, because I, I don't go outside very much, so I figure I, sh I should do that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some new Ruby features, especially the ones that uh, Matt was talking about in his keynote. He was talking about typing, uh, and I want to I want to talk about a little bit about typing with Ruby. Uh, so this is this is soft typing. So he, I, let me show you soft typing. Then we have we have dynamic typing, which is a bit more like a bit more like this. You're moving your hand around the keyboard a lot, and then and then there's one more one more, which is static typing. And the way static typing works is that you don't actually move your hand. The keyboard the keyboard comes up to your hand like this. So 
I'm really excited for those new, those new features in Ruby 3. Uh, so today we're going to talk about GC, let's get serious. I have 20 minutes to present 200 slides, so let's do this. <laughs> Which is a garbage collector. We're going to talk about, I wanna, I'm going to talk about some memory terms here. Um, when we're talking about memory, there's two main places we talk about. We talk about the stack and we talk about the heap. Uh, stack is memory that is, uh, stack memory is temporary variables for each function. Uh, so when you call another function, we, you order, your, you store some of that memory on the stack. So each, each function as you're going down, we, we store that memory on the stack and as you pop up, it gets released. Uh, heap is unmanaged memory where we would just say, hey, let's go allocate go allocate some memory uh, and it just is stored in one particular place and it doesn't matter what functions are being called, any function could access that, that memory. We're not gonna talk about stack memory because we don't really deal with that so much in Ruby. Uh, we do in the, in the virtual machine, that does, but your Ruby code, everything is heap allocated, so we're gonna talk about the heap. Uh, inside the heap, there, there is really, two types of heaps that I want to talk about. There's one heap in terms of your machine, but inside that heap is a, another heap, uh, which I would call the Ruby heap. The Ruby heap is where Ruby objects live, and those Ruby objects can actually point to other places inside the machine's memory, so other places inside the machine's heap. So the Ruby heap, when we're talking about Ruby objects, is actually a subset of the actual heap that's being used uh, in your Ruby program. So we're gonna talk about the GC in MRI, and you might be wondering to yourself, why should I learn about Ruby's GC? And I would tell you that is because you're at a Ruby conference, so you should learn about Ruby's GC. But hopefully, uh, hopefully some of you have apps in production. Like, is that a thing? <laughs> So, like, we have, we have apps in production, and it's important that when you have apps in production, you might encounter, like, scaling issues or you have tuning issues, and it's at those particular moments when you need to, you need to learn about uh, garbage collection because maybe this is impacting the performance of your application. So, what I want you to learn from this, or what I want you to take away from this presentation, if you don't know much about GC, I just want you to learn the terms that we're gonna use throughout. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna bring up and point out some various terms. Just learn those terms, those, take those away, and you will know a lot more about garbage collection. If you already know these, the GC terminology, then pay attention to the algorithms that we're gonna talk about. So if you already know those algorithms, I'm also gonna share some new stuff that I've been working on in Ruby's Garbage Collector. Uh, and if you already know the new stuff that I'm gonna talk about in Ruby's Garbage Collector, please come, come give this talk for me because I am nervous and would let, rather watch. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk, about, let's talk about GC algorithms in MRI. We're, I'm specifically gonna talk about the algorithms that MRI uses. There's two sides of the GC, uh, the collection side and the allocation side. So actually a garbage collector isn't just responsible for uh, reclaiming memory, it's also responsible for allocations as well. So we're gonna cover the collection algorithm first which is kind of counterintuitive because you probably want to allocate some memory before you collect that memory. Uh, but we're gonna cover the collection algorithms first because I think those are most complicated and that's not the place where I'm working right now. I wanna save that for the end. Then we're gonna talk about the allocation algorithms that we use in Ruby's GC. Finally, we'll cover some introspection APIs, so some actual Ruby code that you can go home and use. Uh, and then also tuning variables that, uh, environment variables that we use at GitHub for tuning our application. So collection algorithm, uh, before we get into the collection algorithm, here's a picture of my cat just to relax you a little bit, <laughs> little hands. Um, so what type of collector is MRI's collector? There are various types of garbage collectors. We're gonna talk about MRI's. MRI's collector is a mark and sweep collector. It's generational and incremental, and we're gonna talk about each, what those things mean. So first though, at high level, what is a garbage collector? Well, if you think about, uh, I'm excited about this conference because many of, the, many of the speakers have been talking about linked lists and trees and things like that. And if, you, if we're gonna talk about exactly the same thing here. Uh, when you think about a GC, if you think about objects in your Ruby code, they actually form a tree. So for example, this Ruby code on the left there, uh, we have an array that's got a hash and inside the hash we have some things. And if you look at those object relationships, they actually form a tree data structure. So we have a root, which is a magical node. It's just a magical thing at the root. Don't worry about that. But uh, that, the root references that A variable, which is our array, and that array variable references a hash, and the hash references a symbol and a string. So you can see how this forms a tree data structure, right? 
Now let's say we change that code a little bit, so we say a is equal to nil, and we cut that, we cut that line away from the root. Now we wanna, we should be able to collect this entire tree that's below the root, so that, that goes away. Now the, what the garbage collector's responsibility is, is to find all of those nodes that are no longer linked to the root and free those nodes up. So at a basic, at a basic level, that's its job. Uh, and when we're talking about GC algorithms, we're basically trying to figure out ways to speed up finding those nodes that we can, we can eliminate. So important words from this are root set. The root set is that, that, special, that special node at the top. Those are, those are variables that are referenced from the top level. Uh, garbage, garbage is objects that uh, are no longer referenced from the root node. Those are things that we're free, we're able to free. Uh, live data, live data are nodes that are actually referenced from the root the root node, those are, those are things that we're actually using, data that we're actually using. So the GC's job is to find these unlinked nodes and then free them. So how do we actually find these unlinked nodes? Uh, one process is mark and sweep. This is what Ruby's garbage collector do, does. And uh, this, this strategy is very easy to implement. There are two distinct phases in mark and sweep, the mark phase and the sweep phase. <laughs> So the way the mark phase works is it looks like this. Let's say we have, let's say we have uh, objects that form a tree that look like this. Uh, the mark phase, what it does is it starts at the root and then follows these arrows. So it'll follow those edges and then mark the object and it'll continue following those recursively until we've marked everything. Once it's reached all of the objects it can reach, and marked all the objects that it can mark, we know that any objects that are unmarked, those can be freed. So we go into the free phase, or the sweep phase, and we sweep those unlinked nodes away. So those get sweeped, and then we unmark everything, so they all go back to blue, and we start this process over again. So this, this mark and sweep uh, garbage collection is very easy, but unfortunately it's too slow for us, and one of the reasons it's too slow is it actually has to stop the world. So what this means, what stop the world means is that as your program is executing, all of a sudden it'll just stop. And then do, walk this entire tree of objects, collect all, the, collect all the ones that are unlinked, and then continue. And you may have noticed this, like if you're writing a program that outputs a bunch of stuff, uh, you'll see at some point it'll just go, like you're outputting, outputting, and then all of a sudden it just stops for a second, and then it continues on later, and that's, that's what, what is happening here. We're stopping the world so that we can actually deallocate those objects. Unfortunately, it has to visit every single object every time, so it's walking through this entire tree every time. So we have to walk every object, every object, every time we do a garbage collection, uh, garbage collection phase, and this can, be, this can be kind of slow. And there are algorithms that help us deal with that, and the way that we can deal with that and walk fewer objects is through a generational algorithm, which I will explain now. So the idea behind generational algorithms is that objects, objects typically die young. So the idea is that most objects are going to die young, but if we took objects that were old and objects that were new and divided them into two places, maybe we could get uh, some performance benefits out of this, and that's where generational collection comes in, and we'll look at how this actually speeds up our GC. So let's say we have, this is an example of a generational algorithm, let's say we have two generations, zero and one. Uh, we start at the root node and we do our, nor our typical mark mark and sweep. So we mark B and D, uh, A and C don't get marked because they're not linked to from the root. So we free, up, uh, we free up A and C, and now that we've gone through this collection phase, we say, okay, B and D, you're now promoted to generation one. So we move those into generation one. Now your program executes again and allocates some new objects, and those new objects get allocated in the, the young generation. So then the program stops again, and we do, we do a garbage collection phase. Again, we do a mark and sweep, so we, we mark F. We don't go and mark B, because we know that B is an older object. So we only mark F and G, and then those, that marks D. We do the same, the, the same sweep phase, and then move, promote those to the older generation. So what we've saved here is we've saved looking at B. You'll notice from our previous mark and sweep generate or mark and sweep algorithm that we had to visit every node every time, but with a generational collector, we don't have to visit every node every time. So we can reduce the number of nodes that we have to visit. But unfortunately, oh, and then we go and unmark them. So the performance benefit here is that we didn't have to touch B. 
So we don't have to touch older objects every single time we do a GC. But there's one slight problem with this. Now let's say, let's say we have a memory layout that looks like this. We have B and D in memory and they're in an older, older generation. And somehow the program runs, and we don't know how this is, just somehow a new object gets allocated and it gets allocated into the older or the newer generation, but it's referenced by an older object. Now if you remember from our generational algor algorithm, we don't look at older objects. We don't, we don't look at the references that they point to. So that arrow is actually unused right there, which means that when we go through our normal mark and sweep phase, E never gets marked because we don't consider those old objects, which means that we'll free that E and we've actually freed live data. We have an arrow pointing at that E and we, we've now freed it. So this is a problem. It means our program can get a seg fault or something. We've freed memory that the user is actually using. So uh, what we have to do is we put a, what is called a write barrier here. So whenever we write one of these arrows from an old object to a new object, we put that object into what is called a remembered set. So we remember that that object exists. And that way, when we do this GC mark and sweep phase, we not only look at roots, but we also look at objects that are inside this remembered set. So we remember that, which means that we mark the E, the E moves on to the older generation, and everything is okay. So the important words from this are write barrier. All a write barrier is is just a piece of code that executes when an object is being written to. So when that arrow gets written, we execute some code. And the code that we happen to execute is something that adds an object to a remembered set. Remembered set, all it is is just a place where we can store stuff to remember for later. Which I, I found this word to be very, I don't know, uh, scary, but it's, it's actually not. It's just a place where we put stuff to look at later. So generational, generational collectors are faster. They're not so easy. We have to install this write barrier and the algorithm's a little bit more complicated. Unfortunately, uh, we still have to stop the world in order to do this collection, so we stop and then do a collection. And this is where, like, we can, we can actually speed this up by introducing another algorithm called incremental garbage collection. So I'm gonna introduce this as quickly as possible. Nine minutes, ah! All right, so the way that we do incremental marking is through tricolor, what is called a tricolor algorithm. What we do is we have three different colors for objects. We have white, black, and gray. White objects are objects that'll be collected. Black objects are ones that uh, have no references to white objects, but are referenced from the root. And grays are referenced from the root, but we haven't considered anything that they, ha that they uh, reference. So the algorithm is essentially pick an object from the gray set, move it to the black set. For each object that that object references, move those objects to the gray set. And then we just repeat steps one and two until the gray set is empty, and then we can free up any white objects that are left over. And this might be difficult to visualize just from words, but if we look at, if we look at a, a graph of this, you can see, okay, we'll start out memory that looks like this. We color the root black. Uh, anything it references is gray. Then we pick an object from the gray set, A and F. Uh, we look at their references color those references gray, then we pick from those, color those black, they don't actually reference anything, so we're done. Now we can sweep away any objects that are white. So everything is marked black, and we're finished with this, finished with this algorithm. If you, if you wanna visualize this, what you can imagine this as essentially uh, a wave moving through this, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of this slide. It took me a long time to do this. Imagine a wave moving through this graph where the front of the wave are gray objects and the back of the wave are black objects. So what is the benefit of this algorithm? Why, like, what is the point? The important thing about this algorithm is that we can interrupt any of the steps. So we can stop at a step. We don't have to perform every, all of these steps. We don't have to go through the entire tree each time we do a GC. We can perform each of these steps incrementally, which is why it's called an incremental garbage collector. We can do a little bit at a time and then let your program run again, and then do a little bit more and let your program run again. What this means practically is that halting time is reduced. We get more throughput because we're able to say like, hey, let's, let's stop, stop for just a little bit, let your program continue. Stop for a little bit, let your program continue. So our halting time is reduced and your throughput is increased. But there is one slight problem with this. Uh, let's say we have, we have a graph that looks like this. We're in the middle of doing a GC. So we've started the mark phase. We're in the middle of doing a GC. Uh, then your program is allowed to run again. Something happens. Uh, we, we go through and do, continue on with the GC, so we mark B or 
A and F become black, B, C, and D are gray. Then we let your program run again, and somehow, somehow your program uh, allocates a new object, G. So F points at G, but we remember, remember from this algorithm that we don't consider any references that black objects have. Black objects are done, we don't care about those anymore. So we have another problem here where when we finish the garbage, when we finish the mark phase, this G object isn't marked. So we might free that. And we have an, uh, exactly the same problem we were seeing before where we have live data that we've accidentally freed. So how do we deal with this? We install a write barrier. So any objects that are colored black, we can install a write barrier there and put G into another remembered set. So important words from this algorithm are incremental. We want to decrease halt, or increase throughput and decrease halt times. Again, we're using a write barrier in order to deal with, deal with these objects that are colored black. Another remembered set, so we're just putting those objects into a remembered set. So the benefits of this, this garbage collection algorithm are that we are trying to minimize tracing. Tracing is following those arrows. We're trying to minimize the number of arrows that we, that we look at each time we do a GC. And we're trying to decrease halting. So I wanna talk a little bit about things that the uh, GC and MRI is not. It is things that our garbage collector does not do. Our garbage collector is not parallel, so it does not run in parallel with your program. It does run concurrently, so our incremental steps are running as your program is running, but it is not done in parallel. Uh, it is also not real-time. Real-time garbage collectors try to guarantee a certain amount of time that your GC will run in. So if you have a function and you say, I need this function, this, it is mission critical that this function execute in, I don't know, 50 milliseconds or whatever. There are GCs out there that will allow you to make that guarantee. Our GC is not one of those. Uh, but you can find GCs that will do that. Our, our GC is not compacting. It means that it will not move objects around in memory, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in the four minutes that I have remaining. Four minutes and 100 slides I have remaining. So let's talk about allocation algorithms. Cats, that's me with a cat. I have 19 minutes? Oh my God, thank you. Oh. I thought this was a 30 minute slot. Oh, okay. Let's have a drink of refreshing coffee. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. <sighs> I thought I was gonna die, okay. 19 minutes, I got 19 minutes left, okay. <laughs> All right, heap layout. So we're gonna talk about Ruby's heap layout. We're actually gonna look at how objects are allocated in the allocation algorithms. We've looked at the collection algorithm that MRI uses. We're now gonna look at, we're now gonna look at the allocation algorithms that it uses. Now, in Ruby, uh, when Ruby allocates an object, it doesn't do a malloc every single time it allocates a new object. We actually allocate a chunk, of, a chunk of memory and then divvy that up into Ruby objects. And the reason that we do that is because malloc isn't free. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Slow clap, yeah! I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't drop puns in the middle. I should really just put those at the beginning and <laughs> continue on. Anyway, so malloc, malloc actually costs. We can't, calling, the malloc, calling malloc isn't a free thing for us to do. It actually costs us CPU time. So what we try to do is we say, okay, well, let's, let's allocate a large chunk of memory. And inside that chunk of memory, we'll divvy that up into individual Ruby objects. So we'll, we'll, it, we'll allocate a large chunk a page or a slab, I like to call them slabs, which I will, the reason I like slab better, I will cover later, uh, but they're pages, and a page is, a, page memory is contiguous, it's just a contiguous chunk of memory, just some place on the heap. And we say, okay, inside this, inside this chunk of memory, we actually hold a linked list. So there is a linked list inside that chunk of memory. Nodes in that linked list are called slots, each slot is a Ruby object. So if we look at a page, page that looks, imagine this page is in memory, inside this page we will store many Ruby objects and those Ruby objects are stored as a linked list. And this list is what we call a free list. 
So in order to allocate a new object, all we have to do is uh, find the first open slot, which is just the next pointer in that free list. So we just say, okay, here's your new Ruby object every time we do an allocation. And then we just bump that pointer forward in the linked list. So we move that pointer to the next space, next space in the free list. This is called bump pointer allocation, where, because we're just taking a pointer and bumping it forward. So we call it bump pointer allocation just because we're bumping that forward. So in the case that we have a full page, for example, like let's say uh, you allocated a bunch of objects and it fills up that page, uh, then when you try to allocate a new object, Ruby's GC says, oh, we've run out of space, we've run out of pages, let's just allocate some new pages. So it just allocates a few new pages and then you have more space to allocate Ruby objects. Eden pages are the pages that are searched for a free slot. So that is what we call, the Eden is what we call the pages where we're gonna actually allocate new, new objects. And yes, these terms are very, I don't know, they're <laughs> interesting, I suppose. Objects are born and die, and I guess the, I guess the metaphor works. Uh, anyway, so let's say we do, we do a GC. We have a page that looks like this. Uh, when a GC happens, it'll actually pull an object out of that, out of that page. And it, let's say all the objects in that page are freed. Let's say we lose all of them. Then the page will actually be destroyed. So it'll get, it'll get reclaimed. Uh, that page is actually put into a tomb, and then later we free up the pages in the tomb. So important words are slot. A slot is just a place for a Ruby object. A page is a place where we allocate a bunch of Ruby objects. So we have a, a bunch of contiguous Ruby objects together. And Eden is the place where we go look for a place to allocate a Ruby object. A tomb is where things go to die. Um, so I wanna talk, I, I'm gonna get a little bit distracted here because I have 15 minutes? 14, okay, all right. So let's, I wanna look at some interesting allocation hacks. I just, it's not necessarily related to allocation or freeing, I just love this technique and I think people, I think people should know about it. You may or may not know that not every object in Ruby requires an allocation. So integers and floats, those things don't actually allocate any, allocate any objects and I'm gonna talk about how, we, how that's accomplished. And to talk about that a little bit, I'm gonna to have to talk about the sizes of the pages. So one page, one page in Ruby is 16K about. Uh, so every time we allocate a new page, it's 16K. Uh, one object in Ruby is 40 bytes. Now, pages in Ruby are what are called aligned. And what that means is that when we allocate some memory, we say, hey, give me back, give me back a chunk of memory, uh, but I want the address of that memory to be divisible by some particular number. So we don't do a malloc, we do an, an aligned malloc. So we say, hey, operating system, give me some memory, and the address of that memory, I need it to be divisible by some magic number, by some multiple. And in our case, we're gonna choose a multiple of 40. So 40 is our multiple. Now let's say we take that number 40, now 40 happens to be the size of a Ruby object. If we take that number 40 and we say, okay, well, let's start out with 40 and then let's, um, Increment it by, multiply it by one, two, three, four, et cetera, so we know where each of, those, each of those addresses are. If we do this in Ruby, and then print it out in binary, print out that address number in binary, you'll see something that looks like this. I've done it here in Ruby. Uh, and you can't, it's easier to see the pattern if we just take these binary numbers and combine them together. If you stack all those binary numbers together and look at them, you'll see a pattern emerge, and that pattern is that those last three digits are always zero. So the last three digits, or the last three um, digits in any Ruby object are gonna be zero. And what that means is if you're looking at an address in memory, you can know whether or not that address is actually a Ruby object a Ruby object must end with three zeros, right? So what if we said, okay, well, let's just flip one of those bits to one. Then we know, oh, that, that address isn't actually a Ruby object, it's just some, it's something else. We can apply meaning to these, apply meaning to these binary numbers. So we use these three bits to apply it, to add meaning to those addresses, which means that we can actually represent integers without doing allocations. So the way that we would represent an integer without doing any allocation is, let's say we have a flag one, 
one is gonna be our flag. Now, for example, we have the number two, and in binary two is 10. So what we'll do is we'll take that number two and shift it over one bit, and then apply our integer flag to that, to that number. Now, any time we encounter a 101 in Ruby code, we know that that's not a pointer to an actual heap object. We know that it's a pointer to an integer. So what we can do is say, well, let's just decode it. So we'll take that binary number, which is five, we'll shift it over one, and we have our two back. And we can actually see this in, we can see this in action in Ruby 2.3, you won't be able to see this in Ruby 2.4, but you can see this in action. We can calculate, actually, what is our biggest fixed num value? So if we say two to the 64 minus two, or minus one, and put that out in binary, you can see 64 ones. Uh, but unfortunately, that number is actually a big num. So if we go to two to the 63 minus one, it's still a big num. If we go two to the 62, that's a fixed num. Uh, but if we add one to that, it becomes a big num. And why, why two to the 62? The reason we, two to the 62, we have one bit for our sign. And then we just said we have to use one bit for our encoding. So we start at my machine is 64 bits. So we take away one bit for the sign and then another bit for the encoding. And now we're down to 62 bits. So we can calculate the size of the largest, largest fixed num. So this is the biggest, uh, uh, biggest object before we actually do any allocation is going to be two to the 62 minus one. Now, unfortunately, you can't see this, so you're seeing big num, big num, fixed num, big num. You actually can't see those objects in Ruby 2.4 because we've made it better. You shouldn't know about those things. You should just use your Ruby and be happy, which is what this is doing. So if you, look at, if you look at the class output from these, you'll just see it's always integer and you have no idea. But you can, now, ah, this is being recorded. I'm gonna tell you a secret. I'm gonna tell you a secret, don't tell anybody else, and hopefully maybe we can just censor this out of the video. Um, <laughs> so fixed nums are singleton, and you can, tell, you can tell that they're singleton objects by looking at their object ID. If you print out the object ID, you'll see that it doesn't change. So two to the 62 minus one, you'll see that object ID doesn't change, but as soon as we do two to the 62, the object ID actually changes because we're doing, we're doing allocations. Now, that object ID, this is the part that needs to be bleeped out of the video, that object ID is actually based off of the location in memory where that, where that object is. So this is, specific, this is a specific implementation detail, but you can tell, even though everything is now an integer in 2.4, if you look at the object IDs, you'll be able to tell which ones are getting allocations and which ones aren't. So this, this technique is called a tag pointer, where we're taking a pointer and we have a particular pattern that we know we know that those, those bits, can, we can add meaning to those, we can tag those pointers. In Ruby, some of the objects are, that are tagged are fixed nums, which are now just integers, floats, true, false, nil, and some symbols. So not everything is tagged. Um, and I think there might be more, but I'm not sure. Uh, all this is clearly documented in some C comments. <laughs> so go look at the source code. <laughs> so, Let's talk a little bit about allocation problems. Uh, unfortunately, these Ruby objects, we have an issue with poor reclamation. So let's say we have three pages that are full of objects. Uh, when we run a GC, some of these objects get freed. Uh, it would be nice if we could say like, okay, let's take those objects and then move them around and we can rearrange them such that we have a page that's now free. We can actually free that page, that would be nice. Unfortunately, objects in MRI do not move, so we cannot do that. Uh, it means that we have these holes in our pages that look like this. So we could have freed we could have freed that space, but we can't because objects won't move around. So we've got this potential space that that could be freed, but we can't do that. Unfortunately, this causes uh, copy on write problems, which we've run into in production. Uh, so this is. Now we're into why I don't like calling Ruby pages pages is because one Ruby memory page is not one OS memory page. And this is important when we're dealing with copy on write. So one Ruby page is 16K, one OS page is 4K. So one Ruby page is about four OS, four OS pages. And anytime you write to a place in memory, the uh, anytime copy on write stuff gets violated whenever we have a place where we have to actually do a copy into a child process, it copies an entire page. It doesn't copy just that bit that got written to, it copies one page. So each time we have a page fault, we're copying about, uh, 16K page holds about 400, around 400 objects. 
So uh, one OS page, every time that gets copied, we're copying 100, about 100 Ruby objects. So let's say we have a parent process and a child process pointing at the same page. The child process maybe writes something, writes something to that, and now we actually have to copy that entire thing. The OS, the OS copies one entire page. So we wrote 40 bytes, but we got four kilobytes copied. So in order to deal with this, I've, I've been thinking about different ways for dealing with this, and one thing is to uh, group old objects together. So let's say, let's say we had a special place where we could say, okay, I have an idea, you know, the, these objects are probably gonna be old, so why don't we allocate all those objects that might be old into, their, into a specific location, and group those together. So let's say we have two page types, uh, probably old page, and then just uh, we have no idea page. So if we encounter something that will probably get old, we'll allocate that into the probably old page, and if we have something that we don't know about, we'll just allocate that into a regular page. So what, you know, what is going to be old? Uh, we can use heuristics to figure out what, what might be old. For example, uh, the foo class, we know foo class, that's probably not gonna get garbage collected because it's a class. Same with the bar class, maybe that constant won't get collected, frozen strings, things like that. We can look at the source and kind of figure out through heuristics. Uh, what, what may or may not be old. Uh, we could also do statistically, like statistically determine which objects are going to be old. Like for example, if you have a foo object that, uh, you know, 80% of the time we allocate a foo object, it becomes old, well let's just allocate that into the probably old space. So we could keep statistics based on that. Uh, this helps us efficiently reduce space, uh, reduce our GC time, and also is copy on write friendly. So I've implemented some of this uh, at work. I, GitHub pays me to do stuff. Uh, <laughs> so I'm doing GC, GC work, and I've implemented the one that does the technique that's basically like, okay, we know that classes and modules will become old, so let's allocate those into their own space. Uh, let's look at a uh, cat photo, that's my cat. Her tongue is very long. I don't know, does my laser thing, my laser thing doesn't work. That is an extremely long tongue. I think she's licking her eyeballs. You can see it again there. <laughs> so, her tongue doesn't fit in her mouth. It's always hanging out. I'm afraid it's gonna dry out someday. Oh, I think I'm down to five minutes and 40 slides left. You should have let me stress out more. <laughs> so, okay, let's say that we're going to allocate, we're gonna take these classes and modules and allocate those into their own particular location. So, here's our key. Uh, red dots are objects. Uh, green dots are classes or modules. And white dots are uh, just free space. So if we take a Ruby page and then just print that out with this particular key, grouping our classes and modules together, we'll get something that looks like this. So each of those vertical lines is a page, uh, and then, right, so we've got, we've got some pages in there. This is default MRI, there's no, no patch applied to this. So you, you may or may not be able to see there's some little green dots, green dots uh, sprinkled throughout there, and those green dots are classes or modules. Now with my patch applied, you'll see all of them get grouped together. So if we, we do this, you'll see in there there's a green line, and those are all of the classes and modules grouped together on one particular page. Now if we compare those two, which I have done very scientifically here, <laughs> you'll, see that, you'll see that the one, the one on the bottom is actually my patch applied, the one on the top is just a uh, trunk with no patches applied. You'll see that mine is actually wider, which means there are more pages allocated. There are actually more pages allocated in mine than there is on the default without unpatched version which is bad, that means that my patched version is actually using more memory. But if we take a Rails application, this is what a Rails application will look like. Uh, you can see, so there's a bunch of green dots in there. This is an unpatched, unpatched Ruby version. Uh, it, now, if we compare this to what mine looks like, with the patched version, you'll see mine looks like this. Uh, and the, you'll see a bunch of green lines in there. Those are, those are pages w that are just dedicated to classes and modules. And if we compare those two together, you'll see that the patched version actually is smaller than the unpatched version. It's around a 17% smaller heap with the patch applied. So I wanna show you another, one other great way to reduce the heap size of your application is to, uh, let's see, I got a video of it here. Basically what you do is you take your mouse and you click over there, and if you drag it, 
It's very small. Look at that. That's just amazing. Amazing. Anyway, you can check out, so you can check out these patches on uh, our fork of Ruby at GitHub. It's, we're open sourcing, we open source all of our work on this. Uh, so go there, you can find it. Uh, future work that I would like to do, I would like to work on, the next thing I'd like to work on is actually moving objects. It would be really cool if we could say like, remember this, gra this thing where we're like, we'll move it together and then you can't do that because you know, we'd like to get rid of that page, but we can't do that. What I would really like to do is apply a patch that basically turns that into a, into a yep. So uh, I, think, I think that's something that we can actually accomplish, and I think it would work very well or be very in line with the stuff that um, Koichi is working on with uh, guilds. So I think we can accomplish that through stack scanning and forward pointers and other, other barriers. I think it's possible to do this. So all right, let's wrap this up very quickly with some GC introspection stuff. So uh, you can get GC information by doing GC, GC stat, and I know that Nate was talking all about this. Uh, and you don't need to read any of this for two reasons. One, because he talked about it, and two, uh, now that you've been watching this entire presentation and you know how these algorithms work and you know the words behind these algorithms, when you look at these keys, the key names will actually just make sense. So you can look at the names, and you already know the algorithms and the words, so these numbers will make sense to you. You can also check out GC performance with a GC profiler. Uh, all you need to do is use, this is available in Ruby, you just do GC profiler enable and you can get some statistics about your profiler. That enables it, this prints out a report for it. You can also do heap introspection, which is one thing we do a lot. Uh, you can use object space dump all and that'll give you a JSON representation of your entire heap so you can see all the objects that are stored in memory. Unfortunately, this method does not show you, so you saw in my charts earlier we had blank spots, right? This dump all only dumps live objects, so you never get to see any of those blank spots. You'll have to go look at our patches on GitHub to see uh, how we're printing those out. So you can, I actually had to patch it to print out those blank spots. But what's cool too is you can print out, you can do object space dump and get information about one particular object. So you can just give it an object there and see information about it, like the size it is in memory, 40 flags on that. And what, what else is cool is we can see how, how the GC impacts objects using this object space dump API. So let's say we allocate a new object uh, and look at that. We can see, oh, it's right, very protected. Uh, and if we, if we look at that, or if we run a GC, so we allocate X at the top there, run a GC, and we look at the output, you'll see on the third generation there, or the third GC, it becomes old. So what this means is that every object, in order for it to become old, it has to survive three garbage collection cycles. So it's considered young until we've GC'd three times. Once it's survived, once it's survived three generations, then we say, oh, okay, we're now, we're now an old object. So go check out all the methods on object space, uh, including trace object allocations is another one that I really enjoy. Read the documentation on this one. This one helps you find where objects are being allocated. Uh, some GC tuning variables that we use at work uh, we tweak this environment variable. This tweaks the number of free slots after a garbage collection. Uh, we also tweak heap init slots. This is the number of slots that are available as you, when you start your Ruby program. Uh, and also we tweak the number of slot, the growth, how quickly the uh, heap grows. So what you wanna do is when you're tuning your Rails application, for example, the way that we tune it is we tune it such that when we're running, an app, when we're running a request, we don't actually wanna allocate new pages because page allocation is expensive, so we wanna make sure that we actually have a large enough heap that it will uh, deal with any request that comes in. And I think I'm actually out of time, so thank you very much. Okay.